So friends, welcome to everyone. Today in Pyramid Valley Inspiration is a great day because we are going to meet our two great spiritual scientists in Pyramid Valley International and Pyramid Valley International conducts many many uh, spiritual science programs like Global Congress of Spiritual Sciences. So till now 12 GFSS which has happened here and uh, in one of the events a great spiritual scientist from USA Mr. Andrew Cohen has attended and he was, he was one of the speaker in the program. So there, Mr. Andrew Cohen has met our Brahmarshi Subhash Patriji with the PSSM founder. So there, the first meet has happened, these two great special scientists in Pyramid Valley International during the GFSS event. And this will be one more uh, great meet of these two great special scientists today. And it's a very a great honor and opportunity for a whole uh, your PSSM and uh, especially today Mr. Andrew Cohen sir would like to interact with a, a great master and PSSM founder from Mr. Patriji and uh, we'll be having a, a, a great chat the great chat great chat you can say mm -hmm. and uh, it's a great opportunity for me to introduce uh, this great speaker informal chat informal chat because always uh, uh, Patricia makes us so informal so that we'll be more open up. And uh, this is a regular style of Patricia. And this style and this whole interview will be happening now. And uh, welcome, sir. And welcome, Andrew, sir, to Pyramid Valley International also for this a great Thank you. informal chat. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Swamiji. I have a question for you, Swamiji. Already? Yes. Shoot. So, I said to you a few minutes ago, when we decided to have this dialogue, I said to you, shall we discuss consciousness? You replied, Andrew G., I don't know anything about consciousness. I'm a common sense man. So, what I want to ask you is this. Vedanta tells us that consciousness is fundamental, consciousness is primary, consciousness is timeless, Consciousness is formless, consciousness is beginningless and endless and eternal, and it is the foundation of reality. Vedanta tells us that the, the, the realization of, of consciousness, the conscious recognition and awakening to consciousness and its infinite nature is the source of Brahma Vidya from spiritual liberation and enlightenment. Yes. So, being a common sense man, what, what's the common sense relationship to, to the uh, discovery of consciousness. To my, it appeals to my common sense. <laughs> See, all the spirituality, all the experience of spiritual masters like yourself, like Ramana Maharshi, like Buddha, like Mahavir, like Jesus, they appeal to me, they appeal to my common sense. These are all great masters who have dedicated themselves to the search for truth. I have not done like them. I am a reporter. I consider myself a reporter. See, what does a reporter do, journalist do? Something is happening somewhere, he will report it. I am a spiritual journalist. So I report. I take from the spiritual masters and report what they have done to the common masters. With all, with all respect, sir, it's, it, this is not true. You're, it you're, is true, Swamiji. No, you, with all respect. Why you want to fight with me? Because you are a practitioner. You're not merely a reporter. You're not telling what other people are doing. You yes, went, you I went was to, a you, practitioner. No, but you went to see what these other masters were doing, and now you're, you're, you're doing it yourself in a very big way. So you're not merely a humble reporter. You're a, you're a, you're a, you're a generator of awakened beings, awakened soul, awakened minds. So this is not merely the job of a reporter. A reporter who has accepted all the reports, of the experience of masters. Yeah, but, the, but the, you, you are actively a, a generator, an atomic generator of consciousness, of spiritual awakening, of love, devotion, and of spiritual activity. I tell people, hey, Andrew Cahan has got a great experience. Hey, Ramana had a great experience. And I am thrilled by the experiences. You also do meditation. You will also have those experiences. I will report you, Swamiji, to everybody. That's true, but the radiance but the, the living radiance of the realizer attracts the seeker and inspires the seeker to do the sadhana. Without, without the radiance of the spiritual master, the seeker won't do the sadhana. 
So mm-hmm. now I can give you, I'm not an ordinary journalist, I'm a very great journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I, be- I believe that, but you're not merely a journalist. I'm a great journalist, I'm not a mere journalist. I accept all the messages of all the great masters, totally. A Buddha's message, a Jesus' message, a Mahavir's message, a Zoroaster's message, a Jalaluddin Rumi's message, mm. a Andrew Cohen message, mm. it, 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 it sinks in me. My heart reverberates. But what I wanted to ask you is, being a common sense man, what is the common sense reaction to the discovery of eternity? See, those people who lack common sense, they disagree with these people. These. <laughs> they say, hey, something is visible, it's all blah, blah. You can't see it, you can't prove it. Correct. So I, I don't like it. They're materialists. Okay, it can't be proven. The beauty of a girl, can you prove it? How can you prove it? With the measurements of the eyes and the cheeks and how can you measure the beauty of a lady, young lady? It's by the inner experience her beauty gives you. So beauty of a young lady or beauty of a baby, how can you measure it, scientifically prove it? No, it is cannot be. How can you see, measure the beauty of the sunrise and sunset? It's similarly... We, 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 these things we understand through our subjective internal experience. Same thing here. So I tell you all, you can understand the Mahavir Buddha, not right. scientifically. Right. Subjectively. So you right. do meditation. So I teach meditation. Whatever I learn from you, I teach others, Swamiji. I learn from you and teach. I learn from Buddha. I teach others. I, I have read Buddha. I have read Mahavir. I have read Jesus. I learn from them. And I teach whatever you have learnt by yourself. I teach. So if so if so so generally, when when a human being discovers consciousness, they discover everything is one process. And this discovery that everything is one changes a human being. Totally changes. Because this it has changed me. My journalist role has changed me. I am no more the same person that before. Uh, I started studying all these things. I'm not. I'm a different person. I am a different person now because of my study of all these masters like yourself. Was there one moment of change, or was there small, small changes? All Everything the time? is gradual, always. Huh? Everything is a gradual change. But for a huge change came when I read Lopes and Grampas You Forever. Huh? That was in the 1979. What happened? What happened? There he was describing astral travel, silver cord, astral worlds, Akashi records, in such a beautiful way. I said, hey, this is the truth. In two days, I read the whole book, You Forever, by Lopes and Grandpa, greatest Tibetan master. So I wanted to ask you a question. Yes. I've noticed that in some of your closest devotees, your closest disciples and students. Nobody is a disciple of me. I disagree with you. Well, what looks like? Maybe. What, what appears is always defective. Okay. The, the, uh, your apparent devotees, the closest ones, many of them tell me that since they started meditating under your guidance, they gain access to a metaphysical aloka, a metaphysical yes. loka. And in this loka, they met spiritual beings. Yes. That were not, that were transcendental beings. They weren't merely human. And these beings would speak to them and help them and guide them. Yes. Can you tell me what, what, what your understanding of this metaphysical domain is, is all about and how this is related to your own awakening? Who is whomsoever I taught meditation, yes, I am a teacher of meditation, apart from being a journalist. <laughs> Part-time job. Part-time job. <laughs> so, uh, my part of, part-time job fetched me very well. <laughs> looks like. Looks like. <laughs> looks like. Whomsoever I started teaching, they became masters. Hmm. They became my colleagues hmm. in the spread of this great meditation revolution. They became my partners, my business partners, and shareholders in the company. But what I'm interested in is this, uh, you, you said when you read Love Song Rangpa, you heard about these, these metaphysical realms of reality, these other dimensions. And it seems that your deci- your non-disciples, your non-students, who are, who are the most devoted, they have told me independently without my asking that in their meditation they have access to this 
Brahma Loka, where, of they, course so, of where, course they, where so. they meet spiritual beings that help them and guide them and support them. That will happen them. for everybody. If it happened to Lok Sangha, it will happen to every person. But the, but this seems to be, but what they're describing, in the way they describe it, seems to be connected with you and your transmission. Yes. Since I played a role in the whole thing, it is proper that they get connected to me in meditation too. But do you, do you know anything about these spiritual beings? I don't know anything personally. So this is not part of your experience, it's part of their experience? It's part of their experience. I learned from their experience that I am a part of their experience. And so, I believe in them. <laughs> no, I know they do. Because what I wanted to ask you is, because some, some of them, some, I imagine the Buddha would say, and I, and I imagine someone like Ramana Maharshi would say, that if you that anything that you can that you can see that anything that you can see any object that appears any being that appears separate from consciousness itself is an apparition is an illusion is on ulti ultimately nothing is an illusion sorry huh nothing is an illusion nothing is an illusion everything is real everything is real what does this mean it means matter is real consciousness is real that is my reading you see Adi Shankaracharya said Jagan Nidhya Brahma Satyam Whatever you see is illusion, that consciousness, Brahma Satyam, it is the classical Adi Shankaracharya view. Me. Jagan Nidhya Brahma Satyam, Jeevo Brahma Eva Naparaha. This consciousness is only Brahma. Which means it's like the screen on which the movie appears. Yes. So, then the materialists say opposite. It Jagat works. Satyam, Brahma yeah. Midhya. Correct. Jivo Jagadaiva Naparaha. That is a Charvaka philosophy, materialist philosophy. Or whatever you see, that's the only other thing. There's nothing like consciousness. Correct. So Jagan, Jagat Satyam, Brahma Midhya. Midhya means illusion. Satyam means truth. Yeah. This world is truth. That Brahma, whatever you are talking, stupid fellow, there's all nothing is there. Right. So this is a materialistic view, Charvaka view. Yeah. Then Buddha came. Yeah. He gave a third interpretation. He said, Jagat Shunyam, Brahma Shunyam. There is no consciousness and there is no object, there is no subject. There is no, emptiness. There is only emptiness. Jagat Shunyam, yeah. Brahma Shunyam, yeah. Jeeva Shunya Iva Naparaha. This consciousness, this, this witness is also an emptiness. I understand that, sir. So that's why in relationship to that definition of, of ultimate reality... I am coming, Swamiji. Okay. So there are four viewpoints. First viewpoint is... Jagat Satyam Brahma Midhya, that is a materialist view. Adi Shankaracharya, Jagat Midhya Brahma Satyam. And Buddha's view, both are, both are idiots, <laughs> Bo both, are, both, is, both are emptiness. There is nothing but emptiness everywhere. Right. But I say, yeah. the fourth one, yeah. Jagat Satyam Brahma Satyam, Jeevo Dvayam Naparaha. This, this consciousness is both object and as well as subject. The object is true. That's why you are taking a birth. If this was not true, you wouldn't take a birth. So in Buddhism, they say there's there's two truths: relative truth and absolute truth. Is that what you're talking? Is that what you're pointing to? Only one truth: that this is truth, consciousness is truth. But, but they say, I don't agree with Buddhists. <laughs> but they say that. that so they are against. No, but they, but they say that in absolute reality. There's only one. In absolute reality, there's only one. There's no you, there's no me, there's no here, there's no there, there's no up, there's no down, there's no east, there's no west. There's, there's only one. In relative reality, we see the many. The relative appearances of the one. But in absolute reality, That's what there's I'm only saying. the, the one. The relative reality is as important, as truthful as the absolute reality. Both are real realities. You, you don't think abs absolute reality is a little more important? Nothing. Aray Baba, if it is more important, why would the relative reality come into existence at all? Because I think God, God was curious what it would be like to... I, I always believed, my belief, I can't prove it, that God was curious what would it be like to take form. What would it be like to take form? And he is very, very thrilled with the form. He's what? He is very thrilled with the form. His I, creation. I agree with that. But, that, yeah. but that, that him taking form, I believe, is what this universe is. So it is a very valid reality. The relative reality is a very valid reality. It's valid. My, I, I agree with you. It's valid. But, it, but it, uh, it's valid and it's real. As you say, I agree, it's real. But there's a difference between being relatively real and absolutely real. 
Because both are realities. Yeah, they are. But so I, I will but, say, but, Jagat Satyam, Brahma Satyam. Both I, are truth. No. I, when you say re relative reality and absolute reality, it admits they're both real, but it says that the highest reality, absolute reality, is, 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 a, is a deeper understanding of truth, that there's only one. See, or none. You, you'll be able to better live in the relative reality when you understand that universal reality correct, also. Correct, absolutely. It changes everything. Understand? It changes everything. So you will be able to enjoy your relative reality. Because we know it's only relative. I like my ice cream. I like my cricket. But yes, but the, but the difference is we, we could say an enlightened person knows that relative reality is only relatively real and that's why he or she is able to be here without fear. Whereas an unenlightened person doesn't know that relative reality <coughs> is only relatively real. They believe it's absolutely real, so therefore they live in For truth. me, the so-called, you are relative reality and absolute reality are, are both equal and equal, equal importance, equal greatness, equal significance. But, 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 but relative reality can't give us moksha. Without, when you don't know the absolute Correct. reality, that's then it that's gives that's you dukkha. That's my but point. when you know you are absolute this that's gives you point. more. This gives, this, I guess I added importance. I agree completely with that. It means that all is God. All is God. The body is God. The liver is God. The heart is God. Yes. So now begin to respect this heart, I, I, this exactly. lungs. I respect sex. Huh? 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 Yes. Sex is very good. <laughs> sure. I expect, I respect ice cream. Yes. Ice cream is too good. Everybody loves ice cream. So? The, be the, best, the best of relative reality is ice cream and sex. See, in this lifetime, <laughs> I am not given to meditation at all. I am not like Ramana Maharshi. Hmm. No, to sit in meditation. No. I want to be in the so-called relative reality, which is, which is for me absolute reality. It's the expression of absolute reality, no? Yes. It's a great, wonderful expression of absolute reality. Right. And when we, and when we awaken to absolute reality, we want, re we want to make relative reality as beautiful as we can, no? Yes. That is the, Inspired. That, is the, that is the job of an enlightened master. Exactly. Exactly. And he will do the, his job. Yes. He has no choice. He has no choice. It's his responsibility to develop this relative, so-called relative, it's not, for, for me, this is absolute reality, Swamiji. In the end, everything is absolute reality. No? So then? But knowing it and not knowing it is a big difference. It makes a difference. <laughs> See, <laughs> when there is a car, when yeah. you don't know how to drive, it doesn't make any sense for you. <laughs> but when there is a car, when you know how to drive, it makes all the sense for you. Correct. Correct. So, so I, have, I have found that all enlightened masters have a vision when they when they when they awaken to absolute reality when they see the, the the purity and the perfection and the glory and the wonder of absolute reality they they want to they want to help the they want to help the world to become an expression of that absolute reality that is for certain it's a vision of utopia the land of shambhala that's what we have created here in pyramid valley exactly it's a piece of shambhala here in bangalore city exactly <laughs> Because once we've seen that truth, there's nothing else to do, no? You, you, you can't but create Shambhala everywhere. That becomes the unique aspiration of, of the enlightened individual, no? Yes, Swamiji. So then would you, would you say with, with that realization, one becomes a Bodhisattva, that, that, that realization when the world no longer attracts us? The world is no When you longer. become enlightened, when you see the beauty of so-called relative reality and also the fundamental truth of absolute reality, you are called Arihant. You become enlightened. That is the Buddhist term. Yes. You become enlightened. Means there is no more sadness in you. Yes. There is no more confusion in you. Yes. There is no more doubt in you. That's right. You become Arihant. Once you become an Arihant, then... An Arhant. Yes. Arhant. Now I understand. Arihant. Arhant, yes. Okay. Arhat. He becomes Arhat. Arhat, yes. And he becomes Arihant. Okay. Yes. Then, he becomes a bodhisattva. So would you say would you say that the arhat becomes a bodhisattva when he's when the when the world loses all attraction? No, no, no. World is always has attraction. <laughs> Sorry. No, worldly attraction. No, no, no. I'll tell you who is the bodhisattva. When Arihant, as Arihant, he will never open his mouth. He will keep his secret to himself. Mm -hmm. But bodhisattva opens his mouth. Must. 
He, he opens his mouth. He has it's to. not a must, it's a choice. So when people come to him and he opens his mouth, as how he has become an arihant, he is called a bodhisattva. He will not go out and teach, but he, those people who come to him, he will teach. Huh. He is bodhisattva. But when you go out and teach, you are a buddha. Huh. These are the three technical words, arihant, bodhisattva and buddha. When you have become enlightened yes. yourself, yes. you are arihant. Yes. People will not know even, because you want to open your mouth. Correct. Because you don't want to open your mouth. Yes. But after some, a few more incarnations, you would like to open your mouth. After a number of incarnations as Arihant, you will come back as Bodhisattva. Yes. Buddha, before his birth as Buddha, he was a number of times Bodhisattva. Yes. And first time he was Arihant. So when you open your mouth to whomsoever who comes to him, he is a Bodhisattva. But when you go from village to village to teach this, you are a Buddha. Do you remember your past, do you have any recall of your past life? I don't have any recall of my past lives. But others have recalled me as something in that in that and so I believe in them. And I know something is rings me also. Yes, it might be correct, must be correct. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. Because I, I believe that it that it takes many lifetimes to, to be able to hold the realization. To have the realization is not difficult, but to hold it, not to not to lose it requires a readiness and of a, a, a maturity. So. And this takes many lifetimes. Of many lifetimes life. of preparation and yes. experience. That yes. goes without saying. Yes. You are right. Gandhi, to hold that kind of truth, he must yes. have taken many births to hold that kind of truth. Mother Teresa, to hold that kind of truth, he, she must have taken many, early, many earlier. Yeah. A small, small seva. Then finally she came as a explosion of seva, service. Explosion of seva, that's true. That's beautiful. So it takes many incarnations. Bahunam janmana mante gnanavan maam prapadyate from Bhagavad Gita. It takes many lifetimes. Bahunam janmana mante. Then you become a gnani, an yeah. enlightened person. Then take one, one lifetime, no way. I used to believe you, it could be done in one lifetime, now I know it can't. See, there is no hurry for enlightenment. So we have to take many, many lifetimes to have all the experience to all the nooks and corners. Yes, indeed. Understand? Yes. To know all the dark places. Yes, indeed. So in every lifetime you will see some dark place. Okay, no. <laughs> this is light space. Okay, you yes. go there. So it takes many, many lifetimes for you to acquire small, small enlightenments. And finally, you will become an Arihant. After that, you will become a Bodhisattva. After that, you will become a Buddha. So once, once a Bodhisattva becomes a Buddha, is that Buddhahood for only one lifetime or for many lifetimes? It could be many lifetimes also. Acha. Okay. It could be one lifetime, it could be many. The choice is always there. Choice is always there. And a person can say, okay, one lifetime is enough for me. I'm going to Satyaloka to be a co-creator in the whole creation. From Satyaloka. Satyaloka. Others can say, okay, I want to go again and teach. I imagine that coming back to earth and teaching would take would be more of a challenge than co-creating in Satyaloka. It is it's individual thinking. But in Satyaloka, my life must be very easy, no? Nothing is easy, Baba. Every, <laughs> every loka is a challenge. Even in, no, even in Satyaloka? Everywhere is a challenge. Because in Satyaloka, there's no body to worry about, no? But you have to take care of others. True. Like a mother takes care of her children, babies. Yes. How much trouble the mother has to take? All trouble. Now in such a way, you become a mother of the whole universe. <laughs> you, all these people's headaches you have to bear. Yeah. What about, it, it is not an easy job, Baba. And I think the most difficult thing for the, for the Bodhisattva or the Buddha, whether on earth or in, uh, or in Satya Loka, is to capture the people's attention. Because people aren't looking. Work is there everywhere. Challenges are there everywhere. Even, I, this is new for me. Yes, of course. In Satya so. Loka, there's work to be done. There is great. Don't go there, Satyaloka. You will be caught in the work. No, I'm having enough trouble in, in this in Earth Loka. <laughs> there is no trouble in Satyaloka, but there is a lot of work is there. Yeah, bur is, is, is that work a burden? Or, or, is the work or, of love. Or joy, okay. Work of joy. There is no trouble. There is no trouble. Sorry, Swamiji. Even here, there is no trouble for an enlightened master. Socrates was given poison. Okay, take it. <laughs> like ice cream. <laughs> If there were trouble, he wouldn't take it. So, so do you do you feel that the 
that the, that the consciousness of the Buddha of, of a Buddha is eternal, or does it does it realize extinction at some point? The moment you become arihant, you have achieved all the enlightenment. Yeah, but, but does the consciousness of the of the Buddha, the highest level? Buddha no, 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 arihant itself is the highest level. Arihant is the highest level. Yes, that's why you are called arihant. Okay, so does the consciousness then becomes a teacher? Understood. So, but does the consciousness of the arihant does it survive? Does it does it persist for for many lifetimes? It is eternal. Oh, so the consciousness of the arihant is eternal. Yes. So in eternal. In form or beyond form? Whether you are in form or out of form, it is eternal, Baba. It doesn't make any difference for you. There's no difference between being in form and beyond form? No way. No way. No difference. From the point of view of, 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 the, of liberated consciousness, no difference. But there is no difference. There has to be a difference. There is no difference. That is, unlike, that is arihanthood. Whether you are in the body or out of body, arihanth is the same. Body is like a cloth. Yes. Do you expect? Me, do you want me to remove a cloth? <laughs> As you Nothing wish. happens to me. Whether I'm clothed or unclothed, I'm naked. I am the same. When Ramana, when Ramana Maharshi was dying, his disciples said, "Master, please don't leave us." He said, "Where could I go?" See. Same point. The disciples don't know anything. The what? <laughs> They said, please don't leave us. He said, but where could I go? That's what I'm saying. Exactly. The disciples don't know. Exactly. They have not become Arihants. No. But all Krivana Masters are great Buddhas, not only Arihants. So they are Bodhisattvas, they are Buddhas. They are going out and teaching. Yeah, I see. But to see, the, que the question I'm asking you has to do with this. For me, it's an old idea. This is in my belief. Old idea. That when... That when when we become an arhant or a Buddha or a Bodhisattva, but the, whatever the highest level is, whatever, that there's no returning back to this world. Do you, do you, it's a choice, Swamiji. It's always choices there. But this is an old. But, it, but I understand it. But this is an old. I know idea this is an old belief in, in Vedanta and in Buddhism. It's an old idea. In my, Even Bhagavad Gita says, if you come to my level, there's no rebirth for you. Correct. There means there's no force to rebirth for you. But I mean, in my way of thinking, in my in my modern way of thinking. God or the God or the Creator or Brahman is always becoming more of who and what he can be. He's all also growing in, in and with the, his creation, he's also growing and becoming more of who and what he can be. So, yes. So therefore, from that point of view, there's no end to what's possible. There is no end. Which would mean he which would mean he would be <coughs> he would be etern eternally in the state of becoming. And so the old idea of never coming back doesn't mean it doesn't work. It anymore. doesn't mean anything. Good, I'm so glad you agree. It doesn't mean That's anything. You keep coming back, you keep coming back to becoming. For eternally. It's a choice. See, it's a <laughs> choice, I'm telling you. Sure, but, but, uh, but, uh, but if, if someone was, if someone had become a Buddha, there would be no choice. Even in astral worlds, many people are not enlightened, but they don't want to come to a birth, human birth, because they know it's all troublesome. They know what? Even in the astral world, yes, they, they don't the, want to take a birth. There are no, uh, they are not enlightenment. Yes, they are not members of Satya Loka. They are only member, members of Swarga Loka, yeah. or Jana Loka. Yeah. Many people don't want to come to the earth because mm. they don't want to undergo the trouble. They want to work there only and gradually improve. That is their choice. So what? So in, so in 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 one of those lokas, what would be the, the reason that an unenlightened person would choose to come back to earth? Because they want to take a jump to such a loka Achha, okay. in a faster pace. Okay, makes sense. They want to have double promotion, so they have to come here, prove themselves here, and then take a double promotion to such a loka. Very Otherwise, nice. they gradual work. They'll go from jana loka to maha loka to tapa loka to such a loka. It will take a lot, lot of time. And they and they wouldn't have courage. They won't have courage. It's not a question of courage. It's a question of choice, Baba. Everybody is a courageous soul there. It's choice. Attitudes, aptitudes. Doesn't it take? Doesn't it take courage to take? To, if you are, if you are a conscious being already, see, did, would the, wouldn't it take courage to take a human birth? I don't call other people as weak souls. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I'm not. I, <laughs> Only you are courageous. No, I never said that. 
I never, you said that. No, I never said that. I'm saying it take it would take courage to consciously choose. I to don't take agree with that. Bread. It's Why? a question of choice. See, because you said there's the slow train and the, and the express train. See, right? either I want to work uh -huh. or I want to run. It's a choice. I want to run. happily. I want to work up to Delhi, New Delhi. I want to see everything. But I imagine. But, but wouldn't you agree in, in in what you're saying? The person, the person who would be more inclined to run would have better chances to become a Buddha than a person who wanted to walk the whole time. See, if path. he's running, he will not see all the important things that he is <laughs> able to walk. <laughs> he's in a so, 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 are you so? Are you saying it's better to walk than to run? I wouldn't say it's a choice. I said. I wouldn't say this is better than that. But I don't. I believe there must be a difference. You tell me. I will put a question. Which is the better birth, woman birth or man birth? Better from which from which perspective? I don't know. I will just I'm putting which is the better birth. In India, it's better to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, so, right? Easier for men. Women have more trouble than men. In the West, uh, less so. It's the same problem, but a little bit less. There's a little bit more advancement in this. Tell me about. When you came first to Pyramid Valley, yes. Then from since then you are here. Yes. Tell tell us your impression about our, our 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 institution here. My impression of your institution is that everybody that I see around you and related to you, connected to you, is kind, and generous, and selfless, and spiritually inspired, and very loving. This is my experience with everybody. There's no exception. And you and and you're you are an example of effortless being. You, you, there's an, there's an easiness and a naturalness in your being. You're, you're not you're not trying. To, it looks like I mean I don't know you so well, but it looks like you're not trying to do anything. And you and this is not something that you're you're not trying to not try. You're just not trying. <laughs> and I and 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 the the results between your your relationship to life and your state, and the way you're non-students are seems very not very non-dual very beautiful so i have a very positive impression how is the pyramid what do you say about the pyramid of the pyramid i don't i i was only in the pyramid during the conference so i don't have enough experience and then i i on one day i tried to go up one, one day when I visited, but it was so hot I couldn't stay out there. It's very hot out there. So I, 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 can't, I don't have a much direct experience of the pyramid. Okay, okay. But I have experience of, of the people, and that's very convincing to me. So I think, so, so you, just to get back to what we were speaking about, so you're yes. saying if you're running, you do, do you really mean to say that there's no difference between running and walking? In running, you miss many things which you won't miss when you are walking. But when you are walking, your goal is a little farther than when you are running. So it's obvious which one you want to see. Slow and steady wins the race. We have got a statement also. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I understand. But I've noticed that some people are very motivated, have extreme motivation, spiritual motivation. Some people, and they say this also in the Yoga Sutras, that some people have middle motivation, some people have very less. See, so the people with the greatest motivation make the greatest progress. That's my point. When you see from a limited point of view, in one lifetime, some people seem to be lazy, some people seem to be dynamic. But ah. the reverse of will be there in the past lifetimes. You mean in, I'll give you a small example. In this lifetime, many people give me fruits to eat. <laughs> but I don't eat fruits. I don't like. Yeah. Because I must have eaten enough fruits in my past lifetimes. Yeah. Just because I don't eat now, it doesn't mean that I'm against it. I understand. Just means if, if it is not, if I am running, not running now, I'm going slow pace, doesn't mean that I have not run earlier. So are you saying in the end it's all the same? In the end everything is the same. Everybody has to become male and female. Everybody has to run and go slow. So, so I ask you a question. So in the end, I agree with you. In the end everything is the same. In the end. But in the meantime. Differences are there. Correct. Which are insignificant. They're, they're, insignificant. They're insignificant. They're not they're, for an enlightened person. They're significant, very for significant. What? For what? For, for an enlightened person. Yes, because he sees the whole broader picture always. The more enlightened you are, the more broader picture you see. The more broader picture you see, the more enlightened you are.
There is no end for enlightenment. Although there is a fundamental enlightenment is there. It's very paradoxical. It's all about paradox. No? And then, you can argue and argue and argue for, for, for and against all these paradoxes. But paradoxes <laughs> are there. A lot, of the Dharma, a lot of Dharma speak is about these paradoxes. Yes, yes. When you understand all the paradoxes, then you are enlightened, I must say. Correct. Well, you, I think the paradoxes can only be understood with enlightenment. Yes, yes. Which is the consciousness of non First you un become enlightened, then you understand the paradoxes. Yes. Yeah, when you understand the paradox, you are more enlightened. Correct. I have understood all the paradoxes. Because, you, because you can see that what appears to be a contradiction is not yes, a contradiction. Yes. I have understood all the paradoxes. Yeah. That's why my uncommon common sense is there. Ah. When you understand a paradox, you, what comes out is common sense. Un, un, <coughs> uncommon common sense. Uncommon common sense. Common sense is not a common sense. It's Correct. uncommon, very uncommon. Looks like. If we look at the world, it seems to be true. Yes, Swamiji. So I, have, I am a man of common sense, I can boldly say. Yeah. Because I have understood all the paradoxes. At various levels, paradoxes. Can you do good? How can you do good? You can't do any good. It's a paradox. Hmm. Is there death? No, there is no death. Is there no death? There is death. It's a paradox. <laughs> are you a god? Yes, you are a god. Are you, can you be a god? I can't be a god. Hmm. It's a paradox. To, when I hear this, I always hear the relative absolute distinction in these, in Same these paradoxes. Same thing. So, yes, so exactly. which is better? It's a paradox. This is better than that. That is better than this. Both combined are better than both isolated. True. True. Swamiji, it's all paradoxical. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And I have understood all the paradoxes. That's why everybody is happy with me. From this side and from that side also. I th about two months ago, we were on the Zoom channel of, your, of Pyramid Valley and I was speaking about being and becoming. I said they're both expressions of Brahman. Of course, sir. And then you, you listened and you said to me, yes, Andrew, it's a, it's a paradox. I said, yes. Yes, yes. But not everybody understands this. How can anybody understand, Baba? Can you understand music, classical music of uh, M.S. Subhadashmi? You can't understand. You can't understand German. How can you understand everything? That doesn't go against you. Whatever you understand, that goes for you. But whatever you don't understand, that, goes, that doesn't go against you. It can. It doesn't go against you, sorry. In life, sometimes if you don't understand things, you can, you can, get, you can take the wrong road. No, no. When you think for one, one lifetime, it can go, but several lifetimes are there. Achha. Well, in the long run, it's all going to work yeah, out. Always in the long run. I play one game, chess game, I lose it, but in the middle, I say, come on, one more chess game, then I will win. So do you, when you think about karma, do you, do you think about human karma, planetary karma, cosmic karma on these levels? I am not bothered about planetary karma, yeah, that is beyond my no but, for no, but for example, you're saying, you're saying that in the short term, in the short, <coughs> from a short, short term perspective, Certain things seem more important than others, but you're saying in the in long run everything will work out. Yeah, but in the short term, some things are more important than others. Exactly. So, for example, now the big problem is the environment is a huge problem. Global the global warming. And do you, do you feel this is going to work itself out? I don't care. <laughs> because you don't care because why? Because planetary karma is not in my hands. It is in the hands of the, all the multitude of human beings. Yes. But individual karma is in your own hand. So I con individual karma is in your correct, own hand. Correct. So I consider upon individual karma. Planetary karma, the planet will take care. I don't take care. What about we? What about we? So don't you think we have, the, on, a pla on a my personal level, my karma is my own? That's all. But you take a, care but, of that. But, you are a part of we. But, but at a certain level, isn't there a certain level of reality of life where we begin to share, at a certain point we begin to share the burden of a, of a larger dimension of karma? As a member of the group, whatever happens to everybody, every other member of the group, it will happen to you also. If there is a big earthquake, you will also die. So what? <laughs> so what? Uh, well, anyway, you will die. Well, I, the, uh, the so what is, for example, Swamiji, I, I see on television now, they're showing the fires in Australia and in California. Yes. And, and then they showed a picture of, of, a, of a, bear, a little bear surrounded by fire, like being terrified, and my heart was breaking. 
But this you like, can't help your heart breaking because your heart is made of breakable material. <laughs> but for the, this was unbearably painful to see this poor animal trapped in the, in the abuses of my species, no? You can't help it. Apparently we can, but we should and we could. Apparently we can, but we should and we could, no? You can't change others' realities. But, for example... You can't di dictate others' choices. No, but sir, but you're, you're, you admire Mahatma Gandhi, and Mahatma Gandhi saw what was wrong in humanity, and he wanted to purify this. He wanted human beings to come together as one. And somebody killed Mahatma Gandhi also. Therefore? Therefore? Therefore what? <laughs> no, I'm saying therefore, Mahatma Gandhi wanted the Muslims and Hindus. I don't want to be killed. What? I don't want to be a martyr. He, I want to live and help the whole world. Yeah, and he, exactly, because you care. I want to live and help the whole world. Because you care. By dying, I will not help the whole world. Because you care. I have to take one more birth. Maybe more. Maybe more. So I don't want to die. <laughs> I don't want to be a martyr. This is my feeling also. I agree completely. I'm not ready to go. I want to live and help. Yeah, by more. living, I can help. Exactly, not by dying. Not by dying. That's why life is so precious, no? Life is... I have a question for you. Yes. I think I know your answer, but I, I've, I have always thought that for a soul to evolve, the soul needs to be attached to a physical body. So I always thought that after the soul leaves the body between births, it's spiritual state, its evolutionary condition is frozen until it gets a new it body. It is not frozen. So do you believe a soul can evolve without a body? That's what I'm saying. That's why many souls don't choose to come to the physical body. Hmm. There is a gradual evolution okay. everywhere. But let's say, let's, let's expand the, the, the question to say, because the soul usually has a subtle body, right? Yes. The soul has a subtle body. Everywhere there are bodies out there. No, physical the body, gross body, astral body, body, causal body, body, causal yeah. body yeah, exactly. supra-causal body, cosmic body, bodies are there. But the nature of the body is all different. But do, you, but do you feel that the soul can continue to evolve without the attachment to the physical body? Soul chooses for a rapid growth in certain choice cases to come to the physical body. Because it's more demanding. For various reasons. Sorry? Various reasons could be there. But the, that's implied in what you said. That they, they would, if they're in a hurry, they would choose to come to yes. a human birth because it would be more demanding. But for every one person who chooses to come here, there are 100 persons who don't choose to come here. <laughs> they are disgusted with that. Uh, so are they the smart ones or the foolish ones? I don't know. <laughs> in the long run, nobody is a smart fellow, nobody is a foolish fellow. Yeah, I understand. I see the whole long run, Swamiji. Excuse me? I see always the long run. Yeah. I see the whole picture. Yeah. Well, those are the two perspectives. There's the, uh, the absolute picture in which uh, everything has already happened, everything's already accomplished, is what you're saying in the big picture. Yet everything is, remains to be accomplished. Paradox. No, that in, in the relative context, everything remains to be accomplished. In the absolute context, everything's all already com accomplished. Those are it's the a two. paradox, a great paradox. Complete paradox. Complete I like the concept of paradoxes. But, but the thing is, I think different realizers take a different position on both sides of that question. So, for example, Ramana would say, I don't care, I'm free, I have no, I have no, I have no attachment, I have no desire. And you're saying, I, I want to be here because I care. And they're both expressions of a realization, but they're, they're, they're the expression of a different position. See, in relation music to is life. there. Huh? So take the case of music. Yeah. There are hundreds and thousands of ragas, melodies, patterns. Each melody pattern has its own beauty. Yes. For example, Kalyani Raga is there. It is not greater than Shankarabana Raga. But the structure is different. Similarly, yes. enlightened people, the structure is different. Yes. They have a different melody pattern. Yes, indeed. Each melody pattern is significant. Each flower is significant. Each leaf is significant. Each fruit is significant. Which is a better fruit, mango or guava? Depends on the person. Similarly, we, who is Ramana Maharshi is better or Buddha is better or Gandhi is better? Who is better? It's not like that. Depends on your, on your particular Everybody family. is good. Every fruit is good. Every flower is good. Every leaf is beautiful. Every baby is wonderful. Is unique. Every baby is wonderful. Not only unique, wonderful. Equally wonderful. Unique is different character. Wonderful is different character. Mm. 
Every baby is wonderful. Every baby. Have you ever seen an ugly baby? No. No. You can't see it. Have you ever seen an ugly animal? Uh, no, well, maybe. <laughs> but usually not, no. No, no way. You can't <laughs> see an ugly animal. Usually not. A caterpillar is a very beautiful creature. A caterpillar? Yes, very beautiful creature. Yes. Yes. What, 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 I, what I love about animals is their innocence. Of course, sir. Uncorrupted innocence. In the presence of animals, we learn that. Exactly. We see our to be own, equally uncorruptible. We see our own lack of uncorruptibility. Yes, yes. So a big part of the spiritual work is to, to, is to realize and awaken to that innocence again, no? Yes, unless you become a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, Jesus said. Exactly. And what is a child? A child is nothing but pure innocence. That, exactly, and trust. And trust. Yes. It's heartbreaking, no? So your faith in the Creator God your faith in humanity is very inspiring. Swamiji. It's very inspiring. Very inspiring. I am honored that a man like Andrew Cohen is speaking to me. <laughs> it's an ordinary thing. You're very kind. Our Andrew Cohen is one of my role models. Yeah, you're very when kind. When I read you're, him. You're very kind, Swamiji. Long time back. You're very kind. But I, but I think, for, especially at this time in history, this is a difficult time in human history, for, for human beings to have faith in each other is it very important, it's very positive, it's very needed. In any time of human history it is needed, Baba. But even more in the dark period. No, 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 no. In yeah. any period it is equally important. You have to become like a child. And I'm a child. I appreciate everybody. I'm astonished at everybody's gracefulness. You're what? I'm astonished at everybody's grace. Hmm. Yes. <coughs> any yoga, any darkness or any light age, people like babies. Especially when they come around spiritual masters, their consciousness changes and becomes less full of ego and more full of innocence. Of course, so because they're like children. Yes, all right. Exactly. We all affect each other. Excuse me? We all affect each other. We sure do, that's so true. In spite of ourselves, we are affected by others. In, so true. Yes, that's true. That's bound to be there. That's why we have to be very mindful of what we say and what we do. We don't have to be mindful when you have become enlightened. <laughs> Everything happens. True. You have to be very mindful before enlightenment. Very true. That's, that's even better. Even better. <laughs> because if we trust ourselves unconditionally and trust in, trust in, um, yes. in consciousness with all of our heart, beautiful things come through us. Yes, yes. Automatically they come to us. Yeah. They come so we to don't us. have to be mindful. Not, not because of us, but in spite of us. In spite of us, yes. Before enlightenment, you, have, you are the cause of your mindfulness. Could but I, yes. after enlightenment, mindfulness is your character, it's, your innocence. This is so true. It's so true. Yeah. What is your message to all the Pedro Masters? My Who are listening to this? Realize how lucky and how fortunate you are and keep doing the beautiful work you're doing. Thank, thank you, Swamiji. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jandu, for arranging this. Thank you, thank you, thank sir. You.